Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to you in the Netherlands, and good evening for you in Indonesia. My name is Habib Rahman Zulfitri. I'm a PhD student in physics at the University of Twente, the Netherlands. Today, I will be hosting a webinar in chemistry brought to you by ISTEX, Institute for Science and Technology uh, Studies in the Netherlands, and also by uh, PPRE, Perhimpunan Pelajar Indonesia di Eskede. This webinar will consist of 35 minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of question and answer session. So if you have a question, please write down your question in the comment section sections in the YouTube so that we can ask it to the, uh, to the presenter. So uh, today's presenter is uh, Rindia Maharani Putri. Uh, she is now pursuing her, her PhD uh, in the same university, University of Toronto in chemistry. Uh, her group is uh, Biomolecular Bio Nanotechnology. Uh, she, obtained his, uh, she obtained her uh, bachelor degree in ITB, Institute of Technology, Bandung, from 2007 to, to 2011, and a master degree, a joint, uh, a double degree between the ITB and also the University of Toronto, also in the field of uh, chemistry. And now, uh, since 2013, uh, she is pursuing uh, her PhD in this university. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome uh, Rindia Maharani Putri to the stage. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like to thank as well um, Sex and the Bay Estimate for the opportunity to be here today to present uh, some of the works that um, we are doing and working on here at the University of Trenta. And I also present some of the works uh, that are important in literature and so uh, today's topic would be manipulating semi relevant systems with light. So first of all, interactions between light and biological components have enabled various important processes to occur. For example, of course, our vision, the reason that we can differentiate patterns and tell colors from one another at the molecular levels is actually related to the interaction between biological molecules and light. Also in animals, for example, we could see this phenomenon called camouflage, where the animals are able to change their colors of their skin to protect themselves, for example, from their predators. And not only in human and animals, we also see this light responsive phenomenon in plants. For example, the movement of plants growing towards light that is known as the phototropism. So these types of changes we can see with our bare eye, and this we will further call as macroscopic changes. But of course, as chemists, we know that these changes is a come from changes at the molecular level. So inspired by nature, researchers around the world have attempted to design artificial light responsive systems. And in this talk, we will divide the systems into two categories. First one is the biohybrids, and the second one is the synthetic materials. What are they? I will get more into that. So first example, photoresponsive biohybrids. First of all, let's agree on the term of biohybrids. Uh, we will define it in this presentation as biological systems that are further modified in the chemically and in the genetically in this presentation, it will be mostly chemically, into artificial constructs. Why is this important for us? Because we would like to control biological activities in this uh, uh, context by using light. To control such activities in biological systems, well, we can achieve that by controlling the key players in biological systems, which are the proteins. So if we can control uh, protein activities, it will open up various opportunities in various applications. Proteins play very important roles in a lot of uh, processes, uh, physiological processes. Proteins play a role from uh, channels to catalytic uh, machine, from uh, structural supports to uh, diseases related um, processes. For example, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, they're all diseases that are related to uh, protein activities or uh, protein structures. So we would like to use light. Why light? Well, first of all, the reason is because light is relatively non-destructive to its protein. And second of all, and this is more important, because light enables a more precise spatial temporal control. 
we take a look at the other triggers, for example, pH, temperature, chemical stimuli. We add some salt, we add this uh, company called denaturin. We, uh, it's almost uh, guaranteed that we will change the structure of proteins and therefore we will change the activities of proteins. But these types of triggers, which are not light, um, will often result in a global structural change and or uh, result in, in reversible effects. While uh, at this point, we would like to have more selective control and we would like to be able to control proteins activities in a reversible manner. So, so how do we generate photoresponsive proteins? Of course, here we're talking about proteins that naturally are not photoresponsive. How do we make them into photoresponsive systems? We can do this by incorporating the so-called photoswitches into protein structures. So what are photoswitches? We will get into that later. But let's take a look at this example. So this is a protein called human serum albumin, HSA. And here you can see the structure of HSA. Um, HSA in cells plays a very important role uh, in transporting various metabolites and various drugs. Before, if we can control the activity um, of HSA, we can control these uh, important processes. HSA, of course, by nature, by its nature, is not photoresponsive. So how do we make it photoresponsive? We can take this site, as you can see uh, here, this is a red site here. We can make it into a modification site. So right here. And then we can attach this small molecule called the photoswitch. This one. Photoswitches, we can define it as molecules that undergo significant changes upon light radiation. And these changes normally are reversible, so they can go back and forth. The changes can be in the form of structural change, it can be in the form of polarity, or it can be a formation of the bond or deformation of the bond. These are uh, several examples of photoswitches. You can see on the left, this is called azobenzene. So this is the structure of the uh, adenosine in uh, cis form, uh, sorry, in trans form. If we radiate UV light to the trans form, it will bend into the cis form. And this process is reversible with uh, re irradiation at different red lines or with heat, so thermal uh, relaxation. This is another example on the right. It's called orotary alkene. So upon light, ra light irradiation, you see this um, moiety uh, on the top. It can be switched to this point. And basically, this molecules kind of rotate to this direction. And this rotation actually can take place into uh, 360 degrees. So it's basically like a like rotor, like a wheel. But of course, it's like it's a molecular level, so a normal wheel. And this is the other example. And this we will see a lot in my presentation today. It's called the spiral pyre. So uh, the spiral pyre in this form is a closed form and it's colorless. Uh, if we radiate UV light to it, so at 365 nanometer, this closed form will open into narocyanin, or MC. So you can see this one breaks here, or this MC, and from colorless, it turns pink. So this MC is pink in color. And you can also see that this is a neutral molecule, so a new charge, but here, you see uh, that there is a charge separation between uh, the so-called bitter ions, positive charge and negative charge. So we have the photoswitches. And next, the question, of course, how do we know that the photoswitches are switching? And this we observe with simple uh, UV phase spectroscopy. So you can see in here the initial state. This corresponds to uh, the spiral pyrene example. So you can see in here the initial state is the black line here. So it's colorless, no absorption at this um, area, at this rough length. And then we radiate with UV light, and it turns pink. It opens, and you see the absorption band appears at 535 nanometers. And then with visible light radiation, this band will disappear because the narrow in open form will close back to this color pattern. So this is what we're doing, and this is what we would like to put into our process. Then, uh, first of all, let's take a look at the examples in the literature so far. So um, it all uh, goes back to 1989. This is an example, one of the first examples, uh, where the researchers, uh, I think they're in Italy, 
uh, they make this um, oligopeptide and they attach spiropyrins chemically, chemical attachment to this oligopeptide. And when they have spiropyrin moieties in this oligopeptide, they can change the conformation and random coil the alpha helix back and forth using the single one. And of course, this is uh, very inspiring at that time, and researchers then uh, moved toward more functional um, proteins, so not, oligo not only oligopeptide, but for example, enzymes, controlling enzymes with, uh, with uv like or visible light. And then not only chemical approach, um, so these are chemically attached. Recently, in 2014 and 2006 as well, uh, researchers have also attempted to attach the photo switch uh, genetically, so with genetic modification. And not only small protein, not only monomeric protein, it has also been shown for more than one subunit protein. So for example, here, uh, it's actually a cage, but you can see only two subunits. Uh, when they have this S-bending forms, assist to trans uh, with light radiation at these crossbody left lines, they can uh, control the distance between these two proteins, closer to each other and further apart from each other. And lastly, this is uh, probably the most fascinating example when they can control a protein-based channel. So this is the example when the spiral pattern is attached. Uh, around the core, I will get into this in more in detail. And with light, they can open and close the pores. And that will be our first example. So photoresponsive protein-based channel. What are protein channels? Uh, if you're not familiar with it, a channel protein is a protein that allows the transport of specific substances across a cell membrane. So this is our cell membrane. And then the channel proteins are here. Three, they allow the transport of specific substances across cell membrane. And then four, they play very important roles in cell regulation. And this group in Groningen, they are attempting, they were attempting to uh, generate artificial light responsive channels. And this is what they do. So they published this uh, 10 years ago in science. This is the group of Ben Perinha in the University of Groningen. And what they do here, so they take this uh, channel, it's called the mechanosensitive channel of large inductance MSDL from E. coli. This is, of course, naturally, is not light responsive. And then they attach spiral wire to it. So here, in this 5 volt form, you can see down here is spiral wire state. Again, it's closed and then it opens uh, with UV light radiation. And this is what they do. So they have spiral wire here and then they irradiate with UV light. And as I mentioned before, spiropyrin is a neutral form, and then when it opens, it becomes charged. So right here, and what they're doing is uh, they're expecting that these negative charges can uh, repulse each other, so that the force that is initially and the force that are initially opposed can be open. Yes. And this is how they um, monitor the changes from open to close. And they can do this inside form. So close, open, close, open, just like that. Four sides. And this is when they try to uh, release something from the channel. So this line down here, you can see this uh, one with black dots and uh, white rectangles. So this one is when the pores or the channels are closed, and this is when it's open. You can really see the difference in the release. Open and close with light. And the second example that I would explain today is the example that I am uh, a part of uh, this project. And this is the project we're doing here in the University of Twente. It's a photoresponsive transport protein. So I mentioned this briefly at the beginning. Humans are an albumin um, that in cells transports various metabolites and drugs. Uh, actually, this protein has at least three binding domains. You see it 1B, 2A, and 3A. And one binding domain over here is in the vicinity of a cysteine, so amino acid residue called cysteine, and it's only one that is available for modification. So here we're hoping that we can uh, specifically modify uh, right here. So we take cysteine 34 here in red, and then we attach spirobar into it to introduce um, light responsive uh, light responsiveness in the system. Another reason we take human serum albumin is because it's a promiscuous allosteric protein. I will get um, in a bit 
what our third proteins are. It can bind over 120 types of ligands, and that's really a lot. So therefore, if we can control the activity and the binding of this protein to uh, their ligands, uh, to the molecules that they bind, um, we will open up opportunities uh, to control important processes in cells. Why is this important for us? Uh, why is the ligand binding to proteins um, we would like to modify in this case? Because the binding of ligand to proteins are at the basis of many important biological processes. And so far, a complete photo control has not been reported, and the largest changes were around four feet. And this is another aspect why ITSA is very uh, interesting for us, because it's an allosteric protein. So if, if you're not familiar with it, allosteric is the process by which biological macromolecules, uh, in this case proteins, of course, can transmit the effect of binding at one site to another site, therefore allowing a more selective and more precise regulation of activity. And this allosteric regulation has been referred to as the second secret of life, the first one being the genetic code. So you see this allosteric phenomenon, for example, in hemoglobin. So the protein that carries oxygen for your body, hemoglobin, is one of the example of allosterically regulated. And you see it as well in a lot of other proteins that are also as important in cell. But the mechanism of allosteric is not very well understood, and therefore it's called as a second. In this project, we aim to simultaneously control multiple binding sites of the HSA by using combination of tailored optical response and neutralized area. So first we would like to have our hybrid system, our biohybrid of HSA and Spirofire. So here we have uh, the cysteine over here. Um, if you're not familiar with it, cysteine has the thiol uh, moiety, so SH group. And in uh, our first switch, this viral pattern here, we attach a, a melamide group, and this melamide group can react with the thiol of the cysteines, and that's how we attach it together. Then after we attach it, we try to purify it using size exclusion chromatography. So this is uh, the normal human term albumin uh, peak we observe here. So we know that it's HSA by comparing to a known standard. But then we also see this absorption uh, band at 315 nanometers. Here and this absorption, um, we know that it's it comes from the spirofiron. So here we know that we have HSA and we also have spirofiron together with. It. So we can conclude from here that they're coupled together. We take this sample and then we uh, uh, measure it with UV visible spectroscopy here. And as you can see, uh, this is the typical uh, spectra for, um, for uh, biohybrids of protein. So 280 nanometer, that's from the protein mostly, and from the spirofire on 315 nanometer. And then we estimate that we have a 1 to 1.4. So one protein and around 1.4 uh, spirofire attached to it. So at this point, we have uh, our photo switch together with HSA. And next, of course, we would like to see if we can still open the photo switch and if we can still close it back and forth. So this is what we do. Um, we take this HSA melamide spirofiron uh, hybrid, it's a black line, and we irradiate with UV light, 365 nanometer. Then we see the appearance of this absorption band, three, uh, 535 nanometer. We can also that it turns pink. We can also see that it, it turns pink. And then um, this peak, when we irradiate with visible light radiation, it decreases to uh, this red line over here that indicates that the sign and partially closes back to spirofire with visible light. So UV opens, visible closes. So now we have this protein, HSA, and at the red spot over here, we have the photo switch. And of course, now we would like to see if we can control the binding to this domain. So we take this uh, ligand called methyl orange. This uh, component, this is actually a dye. It can bind to this site exclusively. And the reason we choose this is because we can monitor the binding. So when it binds to the protein, it's in uh, this black line. So the absorption is around 460 nanometers over so here is the peak that we uh, would like to monitor. So here is the a peak of methyl orange. When it binds, it's up here. When it's free, it goes down to this point. 
So there's a decrease in the absorption band when it binds in comparison to when it's free. And this is how we know if our system, if the vector orange is bound to our system of its release into the bulk system. And this is what we're expecting. So first we have our biohybrid and we buy methyl orange to the site that we modify. And then we would like to irradiate them with UV and we would like to see it's released and we'd like to see it binds back with visible radiation. And that's exactly what we see. So this is the system again. This is a uh, human albumin, the forest which is in the red spot. We have the methyl orange right here, the orange circle bound to HSA in this domain that we modify the forest switch. And then we radiate with UV. We see this appearance of the neurocyanin band, characteristic neurocyanin band. And then we radiate with visible light and it decreases, which means that it closes. And what we monitor further is at 460 nanometer, where the methyl orange absorbs so here. And you can see this orange line. So initially it's up here. When we radiate with UV, it goes down. And of course, we have performed um, quite a considerable amount of controls experiment to uh, make sure that this is from the methyl orange and not from something else that might, uh, may present in the system. So we have this initial form, and then it decreases upon UV light radiation. So look at this again. This is when it binds, and this is when it's free. And this is what we see. This is when it binds, and this is when it's released. And it binds back to a certain extent, but not. Fully so we have 16% of the bound ligand released and only 8% of the released ligand rebinds the protein. So we do have this uh, release and re uh, rebinding um, with, with light trigger. So next, of course, we would like to understand uh, how can we, uh, uh, obviously uh, we would like to for it to happen, but uh, we of course need to um, further determine why it happens in molecular level. So we have the HSA and we have the dye here, and this is the uh, complex of HSA and dye. Now we would like to see the binding affinity because if it can be released, that means the binding affinity or the binding constants is decreased. And therefore we do this fluorescence quenching titration. Um, I will not talk about the technique uh, in detail because of uh, the time that we have. So I'll just show you this summary down here. So we have the methyl orange here. When we have the HSA spirovirus, so the closed form, it binds this high. The binding constant is uh, up here. And then when it opens, the binding constant decreases for about five-fold. And this, uh, we assume, what causes the release of the ligand. We also take another ligand that is bromocrystal green, and we can also see this decrease, although the decrease is not uh, huge is this one. So it's around five-fold and this one is only around 1.3-fold. So. Okay, so now we have this side. Again for modification. This uh, red spot is modification, methyl orange binds to it. And then what we do, um, we bind another ligand that is a drop. It's called diclofenac, this green circle. It binds here and there. It's one to one to one ratio. This diclofenac is not a chiral molecule, as you can see. But when it, it is bound to this pocket of HSA, it will have this induced chirality that we can observe with circular electrolysis. And this is what we see. When we have a methyl orange here and the drugs are down here, um, remember that we only modify this domain. You know, we don't modify this these domains. So only one modification at the site. But the domains, the binding domains, they can communicate with each other by allosteric interaction. But we can see here, this is the drug that binds. And when we radiate, it goes down. And more interestingly, even in the absence of methyl orange, so when we don't have this, but we do have modification here. So we have photo switch here, but no methyl orange. The drugs are still released upon radiation. And we would like to uh, confirm this further. So what we do is that we take our mixture of HSA uh, and then neurocyanin and then the drugs and methyl orange. So we radiate and then we filter whatever uh, that are released. And this is what we see. We see this peak of methyl orange at 460 nanometers. So methyl orange is released. Um, it is expected from the beginning. But we also see another peak right here. And this is the green peak. 
here, it was a green rectangle. And this is the character's deck of an act, which means it's also released. 6% together with 40%. So the conclusion is we have one switch right here, but because they can communicate with each other, we can release two types of ligands at the same time. And lastly, uh, so far I've been uh, presenting examples where we have biohybrids. So we have proteins and we have photo switches together. And then we can control binding activity, for example. We can control uh, the transport across the channels. But this last example, I would like to present a synthetic system. So this is the work in the University of Twente as well. It's from a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Sukhita Yamsar. So this work was published in Nature Chemistry uh, last year. So in relation with biological components, um, they, in this lab, uh, Supi and her co-workers, they design a biomimetic system, which means a synthetic system that can imitate biological functions. So they take inspiration from this plant tendril that can move with light, and they made synthetic ribbon, ribbon to imitate this plant tendril. They make it from liquid crystal. Liquid crystal are a state between liquid and solid crystal, so it may flow like liquid, but the molecules may be oriented and crystallized. Like this, they take a polymerizable group so they can make a ribbon out of it. And importantly, they have flow switch. Here as a benzene, so trans, to cysts. They make ribbons out of it, and then they can cut to a certain angles. Um, so you see the angles over here. The angular offset is defined as the angle between the orientation of the molecules and the cutting directions of this ribbon. And they add this left-handed twist with a chiral moiety over here to introduce the twisting of the ribbon. So they can cut it zero degrees, for example, right here, and 45 degrees against this uh, molecular uh, geometries. And then at some degrees, they, at several degrees, they can have helical structure like this. And we see at a molecular level, this is what happens. So there are azobenzines incorporated inside the ribbon, so in the transform. And with UV light radiation, this will, uh, will bend into cis form. And this will be observed not only like at molecular scale, but also at microscopic scale. So you can, we can see that because of this bending, this part will elongate. Like that. And this part will contract. That's what we see, uh, what uh, they see in this project. So this uh, form will unwind to uh, this form, will wind to, uh, to this smaller ribbon. And I would like to show you a video. This again. So this one, we sh when she cut it 105 degrees, that's the ribbon. And so there is an unwinding motion, an unwinding motion here. So, unwind. And then another example is this one, if she cut it 45 degrees, you see that the helix winds, just like plant tender. And she can mix this property, so unwinding and winding together like this. She can mix it and this movement. She can make this movement. And she can carry something up here, so this magnetic deep. And there is also a magnet down here. But you can see it moves that direction to another direction due to the magnet up here. And this ribbon again, uh, it moves with light radiation. You see when the screen turns uh, blue, that's with UV light radiation, and the screen turns um, light, that's a visible light radiation. So this uh, takes me to my conclusion that incorporation of photo switches in protein structure is effective to obtain significant control of protein activity by not only biohybrid system, it can also be incorporated in polysynthetic system to mimic phenomena in nature. And the future directions would be uh, for applications in vivo in cells and in vitro out cell, out of, out of cells to be able to uh, have a controlled release of drugs, for example, delivery agents, and I would like to thank uh, my collaborators in this project that I'm working, and then my supervisors in the University of Twente, and in my group, Biomolecular Nanotechnology, in the University of Twente, and of course, my funding um, source scholarship, LPDP, in the University of
And before I close this presentation and give the floor back to the host, I would like to quote um, a professor from France. Uh, he's called Professor Jean Moulin. Now, he won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in uh, 1987. He came here to Twente, um, 28th of September this year, to give a talk. And this is what he said. He said that think that you are a part of a big construction called science. And you are not just a chemist, but you are a scientist. He said that we should be modest, that we should be proud. Modest because we know that we will not be able to solve other problems because our life's too short and our field is like too limited. But do be proud because you are contributing to it. Some people will bring a small stone to the building, to the science building, and some people will bring a big stone. But nevertheless, no matter if you have to bring a if you're bringing a small stone, you bring a big stone. That is your stone. That is your contribution, and no one can take it from you. Thank you. So, um, thank you. All. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was a very uh, inspiring presentation. It's also very well uh, presented by uh, by Lindia. So nevertheless, uh, we have here a couple of questions that uh, we want to ask uh, Rindia about. The first one is, uh, what happened if we use the sun like for the chemical reaction that you presented? I mean, uh, in the sense that the sun like uh, have the radiations that is coming from the UV, that spread from the UV into the, the infrared. What happened if we if we use that like directly without the selection of a particular wavelength? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If we uh, take a look at the examples, maybe we can go back to the slide. Um, so examples of the first pictures. So, for example, here uh, for Spotify, for example. Um, it opens with UV light and closes with visible light. So I would expect with just um, either ambient light or um, sunlight that is not filtered at certain wavelengths, then this process can still happen, but of course you will have a competing process. So with UV of the sun, for example, it will open, but then there's also this ratio of closing that. So uh, in my opinion, we do need a, a filter of light so at a certain wavelength to, to enable a more effective control of the UV closing. Yes, yeah. And uh, okay, uh, maybe going back to this uh, slide again when we show the, uh, the, the reaction. So, uh, so the, this reaction happened with the light. I mean, uh, the, 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 the constant, the rate constant will be, uh, it will be very uh, high. So, that yeah. uh, uh, how can we make a, a reaction like this uh, in, in which the, the forward reaction is faster than the backward? Okay. Yeah, that uh, I didn't mention actually in my uh, presentation. So, for example, at, uh, with the switch that we're using, the spiropyran to neurocyanin, it happens within five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's rather fast. And the visible light radiation also it takes up to seven minutes or so. So it's quite fast. So uh, we don't do um, anything with spiropyran, but in our group, it's, it's not my work, but it's a colleague of mine with azobenzene. So you know, we know that the transform is more stable. And when it opens to this form, uh, the, cis, uh, the cis form is less stable. We can see it. it's open, uh, it's bending right here, but it will come back to this form. Mm -hmm. And it, it will not be that fast, but if we radiate, it will be faster. How do we make this form, for example, more stable? So this um, conversion back, how do we make it slower? And that what they did now, what they're doing now, uh, they try to modify this azobenzene uh, foreign, foreign atoms. So they make fluorinated as a benzene so that the Swiss form is more stable. So to answer your question is to, I would imagine chemical modification to some extent, of course, when you design it well, then, um, that will, will um, slow down the reaction of chewing. And then uh, can you prevent the reaction, for example, the backward reaction, so that you only have one way reaction? Um, for these systems, not that I know of. So these systems, um, the slides, the, the three examples, I know that they are, they are all reversible, which is actually more preferable. So you want to be able to switch your system on and off on and off the cycle. But I am uh, aware of an example 
of an irreversible switch. So it's a it's completely different design, but uh, they were able to uh, deform a bond, so a bond flat playfish. Um, covalent bond is playfish and it can go back. So it's another designer system when you, where you can have a reversible uh, design with reversible switch. But these examples they're presenting are rather Okay, and then at that comes uh, uh, for the last question that I got so far. Uh, it is uh, so, so, so. What is the role of theoretical research on this particular field? Do you, can you ob obtain all of the information using uh, the uh, the experimental setup that you design, or you need some other data that maybe theories can provide? Yeah, yeah. Actually, for the examples that I've presented, especially with the proteins, because uh, we have proteins are quite complex. Mm -hmm. It's rather huge and mm -hmm. it, it, it is made up by a lot of uh, different molecules. Uh, for example, the channels where it can uh, and, mm -hmm. and even our example in the transport proteins that can be released in humans. That is just what we see from the experiment. We see that some ligands are released, but we do not know exactly what happened in this function. So we know that it must have been um, the changes in the environment. So when it um, close uh, when it changes from close to open. Probably some amino acid residues are disturbed. For mm -hmm. example, there's a changes in environmental uh, binding pathway, in the environment of the binding pathway. We know that for sure. But what are the changes? Uh, we don't know uh, for the experimental term. We would need crystal structure, and it can be also uh, be aided by the computational, for example, um, it's some simulations. I mean, I'm not familiar with the computational studies, but. I would imagine some simulations uh, will help us to determine what really happened in this function mm -hmm. at the molecular level. Yeah. So, um, contribution from computational uh, scientists are always welcome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and we got a question here in, in YouTube. Uh, so, thank you for the interesting presentation. We would like to ask you something regarding your explanation in slide number 11. So, can we go to slide number 11? Yeah. 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 Uh, and the question is, uh, how did you know that the protein and the molecule is chemically binded while there is no shifting from the peak of UV phase spectrum? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for this one, we know that they're together. We have to go back at this other slide. So this is for sure. We know them together from this experiment with size exclusion from out of the peak. So um, in detail, uh, we add the spiropyrene excess. We attach it to this one. Reacts for about an hour, and then what we do is that we purify the uh, excess of uh, the non-binding uh, spiropyrene with size exclusion chromatography. So in this system, with size exclusion chromatography, so we, we take our samples and then we put it through the column, and through this column there is 24 times dilution. And before we put it to the column, we do dialysis to remove the non-bound spirochyrene. So we do dialysis overnight, and then we run it through the column. And this column has this um, aforementioned 24 times dilution. So any spirochyrene that is not covalently bound to the HSA should be removed. And we uh, we also uh, check that uh, with our uh, UV phase uh, spectrum. So here you see this size exclusion chromatogram. Let me just point at this as we speak. And this is the peak of human serum albumin. We can compare it to standard. If we take this uh, peak over here, this absorption band at 350 nanometer, if it's only HSA, this will not be as high. It will be just around here. But you see this uh, absorption band quite high over here. And this is from 350 nanometer. And this is from the spirophyron. So this is how we know that we have spirophyron and HSA together. Because we're sure that we have removed everything with overnight dialysis and with the column chromatography, size exclusion chromatography, and uh, we see this band of spirochyrene. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, size exclusion chromatography, it's a separation, yeah, of course, based on size. So huge molecules like proteins, they show up uh, around here, or even if it's larger, like ribosomes, will show up here. But small molecules like spirochyrene will just uh, show up later, much later in the, in the evolution, falling right here. So this is protein, and this is the absorption of the spirochyrene. I hope uh, that's, that's clear.
Uh, yeah, so that's a very clear answer. So the, the question is asked by a college in, uh, in, in that is now in Japan. So her name is Sally Nastik. Yeah, so, so, uh, <laughs> so we are now at uh, 2.43. So we have like uh, two minutes before the presentation ends. So uh, maybe uh, you can conclude on your presentation or what is the contribution that you can make based on your research be in like 30 seconds, but that would be 30. Great, yeah. Yeah, so, so far we are developing uh, in our lab in the University of Twente and also in other labs, for example, Cronin, what uh, researchers have attempted is to be able to control proteins or protein mimicking systems uh, with light. And um, at this point, uh, we have to admit that everything are at molecular scales, at lab scale. But I know that there are uh, attempts are made to improve it to more of a microscopic scale to produce really forest and more and stuff like that. But I would envision that this system can be used for this course optimization here and there to be able to um, generate effective systems for drug therapy agents, for example, that you can would be the dream if you can just you know, take drugs or inject drugs at some point and then radiate and the drugs will be released at that point mm -hmm. and will not go anywhere else. So mm -hmm. we'll minimize the side effects. Mm -hmm. Or if you have soft robotics, like the last example where you have these tendrils that just mm -hmm. uh, unwind, um, unwind. So you can carry something with it. It will be like a force, it will be like a robotics that you can probably use. Oh, molecular robot. Molecular robot. Yeah. But that, that would be the, the feature. Ah, okay. Great. So now we have only one minute. So with like uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you, Arindya Maharani Putri, uh, for the her presentation that is uh, very inspiring, and and also for you, the audience, to uh, to bear with us in this uh, YouTube video for forty five minutes, and also for the question that we got so far. So uh, so this webinar is brought to you uh, to us by ISTEX, the uh, Institute for Science and Technology Studies in the Netherlands. And also by the PPIE, Persatuan Perhimpunan Pelajar Indonesia di Enschede. So if 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 you are a scientist or if you are a scholar that now residing in the Netherlands, we are welcome you to to uh, to communicate your research in this forum so that we enhance the knowledge and idea sharing. So you can email us to uh, istex.ml at gmail.com, i s t e c s dot n l at gmail.com so that we can come to your city so that we can uh, put you live on video so that is all for today thank you again for uh, every uh, uh, moment that we have been here for 45 minutes and we see each other in the next week bye bye